this new series is called The Struggle is Real. The Struggle is Real. So, as you'll find out in a moment, this series is actually going to deal with some stuff that's relatively heavy, um, maybe, maybe even a little uh, dark and challenging. Um, we'll unpack that in a moment. So, I wanted to find a title for it that would sort of maybe kind of balance that out a little bit. And I, I actually ran, there were three other titles for the series that I had before I landed on this one. Um, and this is the one I want to stick with. So, if you are at all plugged into the social media world around us, you know that the phrase, the struggle is real, is actually used a lot online. It was initially intended to connect things that were actually troublesome or difficult or hard, right? But in time, the struggle is real came to have this humorous bent toward that it's mostly used sarcastically about things that aren't actually struggles, but we joke about them. Like, for instance, Oh no, I ordered too much pizza for our family to have at dinner tonight. Guess I have to eat a few more pieces myself. Hashtag the struggle is real. So things like that, right? So to help you understand sort of the, the vision of how that phrase is used culturally and why it sort of lightens the topic a little bit, I chose just three examples of some memes that exist that I found online for the struggle is real. Before we get to them, I want to tell you that if you see any or know of any, please send them to me. I would love to use a few every Sunday, and I don't want to harvest memes all day by myself, even though it is enjoyable, right? So here are just three examples of things you can find online in this idea of the struggle is real. Go ahead and show that first one. So for a T-Rex at the gym, the struggle is real, right? Can't reach the, the bench bar, can't reach the pull-ups, can't do push-ups, right? The struggle is real. Now this next one, I'll be honest, I'll, I'll tip my hand. This is the, my favorite of the three this morning. Go ahead and play that next one. So just, just watch, this is a motion one. That is a cat trying to get through what I think is a dog door that is for a much smaller dog than that cat is. And every time I see it, it's just fantastic. Especially at the beginning, because the str- like literally the struggle of trying, and, and I think it's partly funny to me because I have a cat that looks very similar to that and is getting plumper by the day, and I can literally see this happening in my own home, right? Okay, one more. Let's go ahead and put that next one up, Zach. The struggle is real. Can you see what's happening there? The windshield wipers have broken, and so they've resorted to a squeegee on a long handle. And I showed this to my daughter last night. We were just laughing hysterically. And then I had a flashback to when I was a teenage driver driving a car. And I vividly remember there was a time I had a vehicle in which the defroster didn't function. So I had an extra t-shirt always in the passenger seat next to me so that if I needed to defog my car in the wintertime, I would grab it and manually. So I looked at this and I'm like, it's not funny now. That was like, that, that was my life. Okay, so. Go ahead and go back to the title screen. The struggle is real. So here's what we're going to actually be talking about in the midst of some of that fun is the fact that we really do have a real struggle. Ephesians 6.12 tells us that our struggle, though, is not against flesh and blood, which is a lot of times where I think we put it. We, we, we target people. But our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and, and this is the key for the series, the spiritual forces of evil. There is real evil in the world. Right? And I don't think I have to convince you of that. You either see it in your own life, personally, or you turn on the television and you look at what's happening in our world, and sometimes you just go, it's incredible. The depth of darkness. There is real, real evil happening in our world. And evil happens typically when those forces of evil that are in the world are partnered with by people. When people partner with these Uh, forces of evil, I would argue it gets even worse when it's people of great power and influence. That's when the greatest of history's evils come up. And we all think of uh, examples, you know, the big names, the Hitlers, the Mussolinis, the Pol Pots, the people who have done great, great damage in history. But I want to remind you that none of us is exempt from recognizing this struggle that's in front of us. Even if you consider yourself an everyday person that doesn't have a lot of power or influence, you are not exempt from understanding and combating the real, real evil that's in our world. Because it can grow quickly and exponentially. Jesus says in Matthew 5, be careful because lusts can become adultery, like that. Be careful because anger can become murder, like that. The struggle is real. There's a real struggle. So in this series, we're going to be looking at a series of passages where we see the manifestation of the consequences of Satan's activity in the world through the lens of Scripture. 
What does it look like when actual evil is manifested on the pages of Scripture? Which I think leads us to ask this question first. When I talk about Satan and deep evil and darkness, right, spiritual darkness and evil, what comes to your mind? You don't have to tell me, but just think about what images, what ideas come to your mind when we talk about Satan and evil and spiritual forces of darkness. Because I would imagine that most of what comes to your mind is probably not accurate. I think that much of what we believe about Satan and evil is tied to things like um, cartoons. I think we all probably have seen cartoons with like the demon on one shoulder and the angel on the other, you know, whispering into their ears, trying to get them uh, to do right or to do wrong. I think it's based a lot on medieval art and literature that Satan is this being with horns and a pitchfork and a spiky tail. Like, that's nonsense. That's, that's not accurate, actually, with reality at all. Or from modern movies. Like, when, when you see a movie, if you've ever seen a movie that features Satan or evil or demonically possessed people, and you imagine what those people do, that's what we envision the manifestations of true evil in this world. And i got to tell you, as we unpack what the Bible actually says, I think we're going to be surprised to find that the Bible doesn't reflect at all what we have been given culturally, right? So what does the Bible actually say about the enemy of our souls and the manifestation of evil in this world? So we're going to start, as it were, at the beginning. From the title of the sermon, Fruit Trees and Fig Leaves, you can probably, if you've been in church for a year or 10 or 12 or 60, you can probably see where this is going, right? But let's get there anyway. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and it reads like this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now we're going to unpack this passage um, into, into five bite-sized tidbits for you this morning. But I want to make a quick note of two things. Did you notice, and it took me a while before I ever noticed this, that Satan's not explicitly mentioned in this passage? Like Satan is not named in this passage. So why is it that we, throughout church history for a long time, have associated Satan with the serpent? It really just says the serpent, right? So the answer is, in Revelation twice, there is an allusion to the great serpent, and it's associated with Satan. So we take that knowledge, and we sort of bring it back to this situation in Genesis chapter 3. And the other thing is this. Did you notice the word associated with the serpent? It's not evil. It's not dark. It's not witchcraft. It's not all those things we would imagine. What was the word associated with the serpent? Crafty, right? And I don't think we mean bedazzling little trinkets. The, the, the word crafty, when we use it in English, can be uh, negative to say someone is tricky or cunning. It can actually be used positively to say that someone is shrewd or clever or even prudent. So all of that to say this, the spiritual forces of evil at work in our world are more often much more subtle than we realize. I think we're, we're waiting for this experience of just darkness to overtake us and like the voice of Satan growling in our ear. But what we're going to find is that the spiritual forces of darkness are much sneakier than we would often anticipate. So what does that craftiness look like in this particular story? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's dig into it. The first thing we'll see, there are five things I think we see, and here's the first one. We see doubt. We see doubt. And it's in this phrase. Did God really say? Did God really say? Now, I want to say this. It's really important up front. That doubt is not always a negative spiritual experience in the long run. It's sometimes true that doubt creates space, that our faith actually can grow. 
right? Now, James chapter 1 does talk about the kind of faith, a doubt, that is problematic. It talks about being tossed about and going up and down. In other words, if you have doubt that just constantly destabilizes you, that is not good doubt. That will not do any good to grow you. However, I do think it's possible that doubt can sometimes open up space and actually draw us closer to Christ. I, would, I maybe would call this anchored doubt. It's the doubt where instead of being constantly thrown up and down and back and forth, maybe you're in the boat and yeah, maybe you get rocked back and forth. Maybe there's even some water that splashes over the side, but eventually when the storm passes, you feel more secure in the anchor than you ever did. I think that's the story of Thomas. Thomas struggled with doubt, but it was not a doubt that constantly and permanently um, made him back and forth, up and down. It drew him drove him to Christ. And because of that, he made that exclamation, my Lord and my God, right? But in this episode in Genesis chapter 3, the doubt that we see is directed at Eve's understanding of God's directives for the flourishing of humankind. That's where the doubt is targeted. Did God really say that this is how humankind will flourish? I would put it this way. The spiritual forces of evil want you to lose confidence in your understanding of who God is and what God wants. Those spiritual forces of evil want to divide you and separate you from who God truly is and what God truly wants. And I think one of the best ways to combat this tactic is doing what you're doing literally right now. Because when we remind ourselves through Scripture through the Spirit, through a community of Christians, consistently of who God is and what God wants. It helps us fight against this tactic to draw us away from that. We just sang it in that one song. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Because when we are reminded of who God is and what God wants on a regular basis, we are less likely to give in to this sort of doubt about, well, I don't know. I don't know who God is and what God wants. Side note, did you notice Eve actually responds to this well? She does know. She said, yeah, no, I know. I, I know what God said. I know about the whole tree situation. So she did know. So we have doubt. Secondly, we have distortion. And it's lodged right in the middle of that doubt tactic, and this one is distortion, right? And if we find it in this phrase, you must not, uh, uh, the, the question is, must you not eat from any tree in the garden? Is that what God said? Did God really say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Right? Now, this is where it gets interesting, because I would call this the slippery tactic of half-truth. Because is there some truth to the idea that there's a tree you can't eat from? Yes. Right? But that's not the whole truth. I found some quotes about half-truths this week that I really thought were valuable, and I want to bring them to you. Here's one from good old Ben Franklin. Half the truth is often... A great lie. Or this one. It is twice as hard to crush a half-truth as a whole lie. Or this one. This is my favorite one. Half-truths are like half a brick. They can be thrown farther. And I read that and I thought, oh, it's kind of comical. But then I was like, but does half a brick do any less damage? No. It's still damaging, but it can go a lot further. And then one more. The most intangible and therefore the worst kind of lie is a half-truth. This is the peculiar device of a conscientious detractor. Now, I had to look up those last two words and find synonyms because I'm like, uh, what now? But, a, but, but substitute these words in, right? It is the peculiar device of a diligent slanderer. And things start to make a lot more sense. Half-truths are dangerous and they're powerful. So I would put it like this for this one under distortion. The spiritual forces of evil will attempt to twist a truth that you are already familiar with in order to erode your trust. Take a truth you already know, that you're familiar with, that you even have confidence in, and then just twist it slightly. And it's a dangerous thing. Think about it, though. If God had actually told them that they couldn't eat from any tree in the garden, he would be a monster. Because, go with me here for a second, 
what do they have to eat in the garden at this point in the narrative? That's all they've got is fruit, right? They are not grilling steaks out. They are not boiling lobster. They are not cruising through the Wendy's drive through So God, what a monstrous God if he would have said, you can't eat from any tree in the garden. It's a powerful twist of some of the truth. And it sets the stage for what comes next. We go from doubt to distortion, and then the third one is this, deceit. Out and out dishonesty. A bold-faced lie. We find it in this phrase, you will not certainly die. See, that half-truth was the appetizer. And it made Eve hungry enough to swallow the entree, the full-blown lie. Now let's talk about appetizers for a moment, shall we? Can we all agree that appetizers are way too big? No, okay. <laughs> so can we, maybe we should just stop labeling them as, maybe they're poorly labeled, poorly named, right? Because like my wife and I, literally last night, we went to eat at Coach's and we, all, we often get, they have this, this barbecued uh, pulled pork nacho plate. And every time we leave there, we leave saying, next time we go, we're just going to get that and split it because we're both full enough. Do we ever do that? No, we do not, right? So we get the appetizer. Once again, we're full by the time we're done splitting the appetizer. That's not the job of an appetizer. An appetizer that, by definition, should be creating hunger, not solving the problem prematurely. I have had like one time in my life where an appetizer did the job. And again, my wife and I, we had this, this really big treat. We went to a really fancy French restaurant in Columbus. They did appetizers properly, because there were like three or four of them, courses of appetizers. And every one of them made you more hungry for what was coming next. That half-truth was that little bitty appetizer, and now Eve's appetite has been whetted for this full course of a bald-faced lie. And it shouldn't surprise us that it's a lie. Jesus says in John chapter 8, speaking of the enemy of our souls, he says, when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's pretty intense. This is actually the verse that started me thinking about this entire series, because when you think of things that are like satanic and evil and dark, do you ever think of lies? I mean, that's not the first thing that pops into my head, but Jesus drives home this point. He uses the word so many times, right? Man, that's such a corrective, I think, for us to take seriously the words that we use and the truth that we speak. So I would sum it up this way. The spiritual forces of evil lead you to believe that you won't suffer consequences for your foolish choices. And the best lies are the ones that feed our egos. You can read that phrase that I read earlier any number of ways, but this week as I was studying, I sort of heard it this way. The serpent speaking to Eve saying, Die. You won't certainly die. I mean, look at you. You're a model of health and fitness. You could probably run laps around this garden without even breaking a sweat. Never mind your beauty. Die from one teeny tiny misstep, certainly. That won't cause you to die. I think we think through things the same way. We convince ourselves that one small misstep here or there certainly won't have catastrophic consequences, but you and I know from personal experience, from people that we know, that absolutely one small misstep here or there can create catastrophic damage. So we have doubt, distortion, deceit. Now we run across discontent in the next phrase. And the phrase is this, God knows that when you eat of it, that tree, your eyes will be opened. Mm, sounds magical. Any of you ever tried to cover the eyes of a child when you know that they are seeing something they should not see? And the struggle that creates? Because what's the first thing that happens when you try and cover the eyes of a child because there's something inappropriate or that they're not ready for, right? <clears throat> the struggle is real at that point because as soon as there's something they think that is being taken away from them, they will struggle against that. And that's what, I think that's what's happening here. Oh, if you eat that fruit from that tree, your eyes will be open. God is holding something back from you. 
There is something more that you don't have because God's just kind of a meanie. And he doesn't want you to fully see everything. You are missing out. Have your eyes open. The spiritual forces of evil wants to feed you a sense of entitlement so that you forget the blessings you already have and instead you focus on the things that you do not yet possess. And again, this is one of those things. When you think of evil and Satan and manifestations of darkness, do you think about discontentment? Probably not. Not one of the first things that comes to mind, but I mean, here it is. When we focus on the things we don't have, and feel we need or deserve. I think one of the best ways to combat this tactic is to regularly engage in practices of gratefulness. Because if you are regularly thankful, this idea of discontentment can't harm you as much. We do really, really great with gratefulness one time a year. It happens in November. There's usually turkey and football involved. We are awesome at being thankful once a year. And I'll tell you what, in in my real life and in the social media world, it is so good for our souls to be thankful and grateful for things. And then we get to December 1st and we turn that off, right? And we forget the value of being grateful and thankful for the things we already have instead of focusing on the things we feel like we are shielded from or missing out on. All right, there's one more. Deification is the last one. This comes from the phrase, and you will be like God. You'll be like God. There's a movie many, many moons ago, Bruce Almighty, where he was, you know, the main character was in, he was given the powers of God. You will be like God. Yet that word deification is like a $10 word for basically treating someone like they were God. I got to point five. I have four D's in a row. I, I did everything I could. I had to find a D word. Like, you couldn't end with, like, selfishness at the end when you have Ds all the way through. It's, like, it's a little known fact, but if you can get through an entire sermon and all of your points start with the same letter, they send you a certificate from the denomination. It's gold, and you hang it up in your office. <laughs> that, would, that would be kind of awesome, actually. But You will be like God. How tempting is that? I might argue that our contemporary world today has created a perfect storm that allows the spiritual forces that have always been at work, but those spiritual forces of evil will try and nudge you and nudge me into the center of your own world. I think this has always been true and it's always been a tactic and a temptation, but I think the world in which we live today, a world full of advertisements, pop psychology, helicopter parenting, celebrity culture, and social media, just to name a few, we have created this idea that we can and should be at the center of our own worlds. And it's killing us. And it's killing our relationship with God. It's killing our relationships with one another. You and I do not belong at the center of our own world. I don't care what advertising tells you or social media tells you. I don't care. You do not belong in the middle of your own world. You cannot bear the weight of that. You were never intended to. But I know this is true if for no other reason than this. There was one person who has ever lived who maybe deserved to be at the center of his own world. And that person, Jesus Christ, said this. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And if you claim to be a Christian, to know Christ and follow after him, my friends, it is much more than eternal fire insurance. It's saying, I want my life to look like the life of Jesus. And this is what his life looks like. An unwillingness to make me the center of my own world. It's one of the oldest tactics and temptations that has existed for eons, but it is just as powerful and potent today. So there you have it, doubt, distortion, deceit, discontent, 
deification. Probably not the big things you imagine. We're going to talk about Satan and evil and darkness, right? But these are the real things that the Bible actually teaches us that we need to be aware of when we consider the manifestation of the spiritual forces of evil at work in the world today. So to respond, I want to give you a few ideas, some things to think and pray about here in this moment, and then ideally even more throughout this coming week. Here's the first one. What images and characteristics of Satan or demonic power have you been given in your own life? Where did they come from, and are they even accurate? Ask those questions. We need to abandon these crazy ideas uh, of Satan and demons and evil that aren't actually rooted in Scripture. Secondly, are you struggling with some sort of doubt today, right now? If so, ask God to build your faith deeper into the anchor of his presence. Don't just constantly be destabilized, but ask God to draw you closer to Christ in that season of doubt. Third, do you struggle with telling the truth, especially when it's hard? Amen. I think we're all in that boat together, right? So let's ask God to build or, or, or let's ask the Spirit to form our hearts and our minds so that we can speak truth with grace and compassion, even when it's hard. Even when it's hard. If nothing else, do this one in this moment today. Thank God for 10 blessings you have in your life right now. We're going to have a time of silence. Can you think of 10 blessings in like 60 to 90 seconds? I'm sure you probably can. Practice gratitude and thankfulness, if nothing else today. And then lastly, which cultural influences have the most power over you to nudge you into the center of your own world, into a place that you don't even belong, that is detrimental to you, to your relationship with God, and all the people around you? So take a moment or two of silence to pray and reflect, and I'm going to stop talking for a little bit so that the Spirit can maybe be heard a little more clearly by each one of us, and then I'm going to close that time of silence with a word of prayer in just a moment.